welcome to the Tokyo Alumni Podcast, episode number four. So this is episode number four, but it's our eighth guest because we have to postpone things and schedules change. But anyways, um, our guest today graduated ASIJ in 2005. She then attended Northwestern University and upon graduation, moved to New York City. There, she joined a program called the International Graduate Program, a standard charter bank, a two-year program rotating in various divisions and periodic global offsites recruits from across the world. This included places like Hong Kong, Dubai, Nigeria, it's all around the world. And following the program, she remained in New York as an associate in the debt capital markets team. She then moved to South Africa, still with Standard Chartered, and is currently a global account manager, managing a portfolio of multinational corporates and serving as a main point of contacts for CEOs, CFOs, and treasurers for banking requirements. She is passionate about embedding diversity and inclusion initiatives into the DNA of corporate life and serves as the chairwoman for the Diversity and Inclusion Council for the bank in South Africa. Welcome to the podcast, Sarah. Thanks, Nikki. Um, sorry if, I, if Nikki is a bit informal, but um, obviously we went to high school together, so it was great to hear from you, and this is such a great initiative. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, way from South Africa, quite far away. Um, yeah, and you can call me Nikki. Um, my, my rule is anyone who knew me before I turned uh, 18 can call me Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all have our high school nicknames that kind of stick after the fact. So <laughs> you, I'm sure it's hard to shed those. Um, obviously a lot has been happening in your life. There's a lot of cool topics we're gonna cover today. Um, not that the other topics and other podcasts aren't cool, but these are also cool. Um, so three big topics. First is you work in a very male dominated industry. I think I read somewhere that 15% of execs are women versus 85% are male. Um, so that'll be the first part. And then we'll also talk a bit about living in South Africa in this industry versus living in New York City. And finally, um, a topic we seem to not be able to escape because it's that salient and important is uh, COVID-19. Obviously, you have a unique experience, um, not only living in South Africa during this period, but actually you gave birth to a child about six weeks ago? Yeah, that's right. Um, um, it, was, it was pretty crazy, I must say. <laughs> yeah, almost right in the, the midst of that. So uh, we'll definitely get into that as well. So um, let's start off with um, just your background with finance. Uh, you've been in it basically all throughout your career. And um, my um, this topic of inclusion, diversity, you serve as a chairwoman. What was it like when you first joined New York scene? And um, what were major challenges and obstacles you faced being a woman in this very male dominated industry? Yeah, sure. So I mean, it was quite um, at the beginning, I think at entry level, you know, it's, it's pretty equal, you get an influx of women into these junior programs at the bank. So you don't really notice the difference um, at that level. And I must just pause and say, I'm sorry for the, the noises in the back. It's either my cat or my baby. Um, <laughs> and these are the joys from working from home, you know, and maternity leave. But um, so sorry for that. But um, but yeah, so, you know, at the beginning, um, it was very equal and I didn't really notice it. Um, the only thing I, um, I did notice was that it was tricky as a young woman um, in a male dominated field to sort of gracefully navigate um, the boundaries between being taken seriously, um, you know, as, as a grad and um, as somebody who's providing outputs and um, value for your work um, versus, you know, being included in the social circles and being seen as fun. And um, because there is a little bit of inappropriate behavior that goes on after hours. Um, one of the examples that we had talked about um, earlier, which, you know, I, I found quite shocking, <laughs> was that um, I had a senior economist that was sitting in my same row in the dealing room. And he was like, oh, well, you know, um, a bunch of us are getting together this evening. And oftentimes we'd have happy hour and stuff. And that was quite normal. So after my CFA classes, I went to go see him. And um, when he said, you know, all of us are getting together, everyone's going to be there. He failed to, um, <laughs> to include the fact that by everyone, he meant his friend, the bartender and the waitresses and the people that worked at the bar. And ultimately, it was just an ambush. And it was me meeting him alone. Um, and, you know, I thought that was like a good networking opportunity for me to speak and get to know a, a senior economist outside of a work situation. Um, meanwhile, 
um, he had obviously different intentions. And, you know, when you find yourself in a situation like that, you really need to find an elegant way to exit without, um, you know, irritating anybody that could potentially impact your career trajectory. So there were weird um, things like that as a young female um, entering into the workforce. And then obviously later on, the challenges evolve. Like, you know, you don't, you don't find yourself in those kinds of situations later in your career. It's, it's different problems that arise. Yeah, that's a really shocking story. Um, when, th when this happened, would it be fair to say that there was also a power dynamic and you were, that's why you had to be so, you, you couldn't quite dismiss him out, outright and you had to be tactful about getting out of that situation? Absolutely. Um, and oftentimes, you know, when somebody that senior um, invites you to anything, it's really difficult to say no. Um, and, you know, I think when, I think in Japan, it's called power harassment, actually, because, you, you, you know, you find yourself in a situation where you can't say no, because it can impact your career potentially. Um, and, you know, I've got thousands of examples like that. And um, it's not just me, it's, it's many young women who enter into the workforce. But, um, for example, I was doing a stint in Japan. And, um, you know, there was a very senior um, project finance head um, for the region who, who who kept coming over to chat to me, even though I had nothing to do with his team. And, um, you know, the people around me would say, they would come to me and whisper and say, oh, be careful, he's known for power harassment and sexual harassment. And, um, you know, I think things are changing. Um, times are definitely changing. Those kinds of behaviors are no longer the norm or acceptable. Um, but I've only really seen a drastic change in, say, the last five to 10 years, like throughout my career, I've seen a, a huge involvement with the hashtag Me Too movement and, um, you know, these Harvey Weinstein cases and things like in the States that have really gained a lot of momentum um, has put pressure on male dominated industries to nip that kind of behavior at the butt. Um, and it's nice to see that um, those sorts of behaviors are no longer being tolerated. Yeah, so you've been in the finance industry for a while now. And, you know, it's often been looked at as a boys game, you know, it's a boys club. What makes that industry so male dominated? Like, it, were there any patterns you noticed? Because, um, you know, there's obviously sexual harassment, uh, especially with Me Too um, recently, it's, it's brought to light that it's prevalent in any, any industry, any part of society. Yet, there is definitely this focus of uh, it being definitely prevalent in, in finance. I was wondering, what part of it really made it a boys club? Yeah, and I mean, I think it's um, it, it's an industry that um, attracts a certain type of personality. You really do have to be um, quite a go-getter and quite aggressive and willing to put in long hours, willing to sacrifice your personal life and your family. And generally, and again, you know, I hate these stereotypes, but generally those tend to be um, more male characteristics. So. Um, the men tend to be able to sacrifice their family life or they've got a wife at home who could take care of the kids, for example. So it, it, from, from a longer term perspective, it may be more sustainable for a man to succeed in a, a, in a finance industry, for example. Um, but, you know, I think now that there's things that are changing and because it kind of attracted um, that type of personality, it's, you know, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, um, you know, it was a really a huge um, wake up call when I joined the dealing room because the dealing room is, you know, where all the traders and, and salespeople are sitting and you've got all those Bloomberg screens. Everybody's got four or four to six different screens that they're looking at and um, people are shouting at each other. Decisions need to be made on the spot. And then it does really foster this kind of fraternity type environment. And, you know, we, we the guys used to have like Big Mac eating contests over lunchtime. Um, when and we used to bank McDonald's so like McDonald's CEO would come in and then they would have a Big Mac eating contest and the McDonald's CEO would love that and you know it was just that kind of super like male um, testosterone environment and obviously like I'm not going to be participating in Big Mac eating contests I'm not going to be like watching the latest football game and you know some girls do but I'm just not into that and um, then you have to find like other ways that you can Kind of relate to your colleagues so that you're not completely ostracized because that's that's also the risk is that if you are seen as you know a square or you're, you're not part of the the team or you're not a team player or you're not cool or whatever um then you kind of get left out of the decision making circles you get left out of the informal discussions and that's also detrimental to your career as well so what i found personally is that that environment wasn't for me and um, what was nice about the program I was on is you can rotate through different teams. So I was there for, 
you know, several months. Um, I think I was there for four months or something. Um, and then I moved on to different divisions and not all the teams are like that. And, you know, even the dealing rooms, I think, are changing quite a lot now. Um, so it's, it's, it's becoming more and more conducive. And a lot of the initiatives that we have under the Diversity and Inclusion Council, which is a global initiative as well, and I headed up in South Africa for um, Standard Chartered South Africa, is um, elim eliminating those sort of biases, um, which you know, may not necessarily be, be like overt sexism or overt racism or whatever, but it's just, it's just those barriers that make it harder for you know, somebody in the minority to become included. Um, and so a lot of those things are being broken down. Um, you know, there's better maternity leave policies, which I'm personally benefiting from now, um, and things like that to make it a little bit more conducive for women and, um, and you know, minorities and other sexual orientations and stuff to be included in the financial services industry. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned maternity there at the end, but you, you had a baby yourself six weeks ago and how in the long, long term that definitely, um, you know, they call it the motherhood penalty, right? How it, when women are taken out of the job force for so many years that often has negative impact on their professional, you know, standing. Um, and I don't mean to sort of go down an esoteric hole of, you know, maternity leave, but I think it's just so important right now, especially to you, right? And you mentioned how it's changing. Um, myself, having lived in various countries, I've seen various models and people often sort of bring up their Norwegian model and the Swedish model as sort of being the ideal um, sort of, I guess the path that um, ideally countries in the you know, so-called West, like the US and Canada should follow. Um, as someone who's advocated, you know, for greater maternity leave, you know, more equitable treatment of women, when you do look at these Nordic countries, do you see sort of their models as something countries like the US or like Canada could realistically implement? Or do you think it should be a lighter version of that? Or do you think it's not going far enough that it should actually be like, you know, what the model is in Sweden, which I think is 18 months. Yeah. I think everything's relative, you know, and I think the Nordic countries, um, a lot of sort of social um, programs that the government rolls out tends to work better in a country like Sweden, because it's a very homogenous, b the population is a, a bit smaller. And I think, you know, again, this is this can be a whole discussion on its own, because um, their model works very well, but it works very well in Sweden. Um, and everything's relative, but I must say I was really surprised by how limited the U.S. maternity leave system is. Um, you know, there is no federal policy. It's up to the states to implement a policy, and it's oftentimes up to the corporates to implement something that's more lenient than, um, than uh, the state or the, um, well, there is no federal policy. So um, essentially what I'm saying is that um, there is such a focus on productivity um, in the U.S. that you know, some of these things that will actually benefit the society as a whole has been um, laid by the wayside just because um, it, it's, not, it's not mandated. Um, so I think there is a healthy intermediary between those two systems. And, um, you know, I'm quite lucky because my company is a British company. Um, European maternity leave policies are slightly more um, forgiving and more lenient and, and long-term in nature. Um, but it's not quite as long as the Nordic countries. And I think it's, it's enough, you know? So for example, I get five months paid, which is very generous compared to um, a lot of other uh, individuals in my same industry globally. Um, and, and, you know, there's a reason for that. And it's because we are focused so much on trying to attract female talent now. And there is a lot of evidence out there, like McKinsey has a report and, you know, a lot of these consulting firms have done research to show that companies with um, equitable female board members, for example, or senior female management that are above 30% of their um, female management or senior management population, those types of companies have consistently performed better in terms of their um, profit margins and their EBITDAs and things like that um, over time. So there is statistics that show that, um, you know, having diversity is beneficial to the bottom line and there's a business case for it as well. So for that reason, um, you know, we're trying to become the employer of choice and, um, and we've become slightly more progressive, at least within the industry um, for things like that. And, um, and yeah, I think we're already starting to see some of the benefits from it. So um, you know, I think, I think it's, it's time that uh, the companies that don't do that, it's, it's time for them to start um, evolving. Otherwise, they're also going to see the impact in their bottom line. So, yeah, we could 
continue to talk about maternity leave, paternity leave. It's a super interesting subject, but due to time constraint, I think we can move on to sort of the next topic, um, which is your role as the chairwoman of the Diversity and Inclusion Council. And you've mentioned so far the challenges, especially younger women face when they first join the workforce. So what type of issues do women face um, later on in their career? Yeah, and I think that was where I really saw um, the challenges evolve, you know. Um, I, I thought navigating those awkward situations would be the extent of it. But as I started to get more and more senior, um, it's, it's a little bit more, sometimes the, the um, sexism is, is overt in the sense that you're sitting in a meeting room and people keep talking over you, even though you are the only person in that room that's the subject matter expert. Um, you know, the person that you're speaking to keeps looking at the guy next to you who's more junior than you for feedback, for example. That, that's quite an overt situation, but um, I think that's becoming less and less. And, and more, um, the, t the challenges that you see more, I think, are, are more covert in nature in the sense that it's the things like the gender pay gap um, or the fact that there just aren't female um, senior women at, say, the CEO level or the managing director level or at the board level. Um, and so that's where I'm finding my passion um, in terms of this topic these days is, um, is to try and understand what the underlying issues are that prevent women for, from getting to that point. And obviously that's a much um, longer term game in nature because it's over the course of say a 30, 40 year career um, that people, that women kind of end up stepping back, um, whether it's choosing to prioritize their families or whether it's because their companies um, are not um, promoting them because of some unconscious biases or perhaps they don't have any female sponsors or, or even male sponsors that are pushing them further, um, whereas their male colleagues do. So there's a whole lot, a lot of different reasons why that could be the case, but it's really just unpacking that and, and talking about it so that um, it's not just something that keeps happening and we don't know why. It's you know, we know that it's there, we've acknowledged that, that it's there. And working with teams like human resources and, um, and the developmental teams within the bank um, to put in place structures so that it's not like, oh, um, this is just what naturally happens. Maybe women aren't succeeding because they're not interviewing well for promotions or they're not pushing hard enough. For, you know, it's not, the reason for their, them being held back is not placed back on the woman. Um, it's, it's more giving, everybody the tools to look at all candidates um, objectively. So, you know, now we kind of have requirements around um, the, the candidates that we interview for every position, for example. So, you know, you don't, you don't give an unfair advantage to a woman, but at least you're considering a woman or two for the role. Um, and that's the sort of steps that we're taking. So we don't have any quotas or anything like that. Um, that's a whole controversial topic on its own. Um, and, you know, I, I, I personally am not a huge fan of implementing quotas because then um, the minority population always gets seen as being um, handed an unfair advantage. And you don't want to be seen in that way. You want it to be seen as a meritocracy and that you've earned your position to be there. Um, but that's something that I've been very passionate about. And um, and yeah, sorry, I rambled. I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, you, brought, you brought up a lot of great points. Um, I think um, South Africa is very lucky to have an advocate like you there. And um, the point about quotas was something um, I was thinking about in my mind, and then you mentioned it. Um, and again, it's, it's such a tough fence to straddle, as you mentioned, because it, there is the issue of perception. And sometimes when there's quotas, um, it's perceived as you were because of the quota you got in and not because of merit. And this conversation about you're in New York. I, that's the first thing I think about when I think about finance. I think of Wall Street. Were you actually on Wall Street or were you just in New York? Um, so our bank was not in Wall Street. It was in Midtown, but um, it was very much part of that sort of ecosystem. Um, and you really felt, and also my first job was in um, the investment banking division of our company. So, um, you know, nights and weekends and public holidays weren't really a thing. Um, you were expected to give that up. And, um, and it was a lot of hard work. And um, especially at the bottom of the totem pole, when you come in as a junior, um, you really just do everything in the kitchen sink. Like, you know, you're the one getting the coffee, you're the one putting the pitch books together, you're the one organizing the calls, you're, you're the one just doing absolutely everything. What I found was I wanted to prove to myself that I could do that. And I was happy that I, that I could do that. Um, but after a while, I felt a little bit of sort of burnout. 
And, um, and that's when I was starting to reassess my longer term career options. And um, I, I just realized, you know, I, I needed a little bit more of a balance um, personally, and that was a personal decision. Um, and that's when I started considering moving abroad. Um, and I know that's, you know, I think it was one of the pre-interview questions you had asked me, um, you know, South Africa doesn't really come to mind when you think of finance. Um, and that was the case for me as well. But um, I had actually been sent on a short term assignment here. Yeah. You know, the first time I came here, my, my mother actually cried because, you know, you just hear such horrible things about this country and the crime rates. And, you know, it's the country with the highest HIV rate in the population and things like that. And um, it, it sounds very scary and it's portrayed in a very negative light in the press. But um, when I was sent here, you know, I came for two months and I thought, my goodness, this is actually like a lovely place. Um, obviously, it's got all the, the, those challenges, you know, that that's not um, factually incorrect. It's actually that that exists. But um, despite all of it, it's, it's a very livable, very lovely place. People are lovely. Weather's amazing. Food's great. Standard of living is great. So um, I, saw, I, I thought, you know, I could at least see myself living here for a couple of years. And, and that's when I started to maybe consider it, you know. Or quite often people think of financial hubs um, as a total novice. I think of like Tokyo, New York, London. When it doesn't come to those three cities, though, um, as, you, as you said, South Africa is one of them. Like, where are the sort of these sub hubs per se? And, I, and I'm really curious about this because seeing someone like you, you know, tra where you, you've worked in so many different countries and ultimately you chose South Africa. I think a lot of students who go to international schools are in similar situations where they can ultimately end up in any part of the world. So I know your ultimate choice is obviously South Africa where you're zooming in from right now, but wh what other places were you sort of flirting with? What areas were you thinking, okay, like it's not New York, but I like this place. Yeah, so I mean, I work for a bank that um, is predominantly in the emerging markets. So our big um, footprint markets are kind of Middle East, Asia and, um, and Africa. And, um, you know, I was in the New York branch and that was great. And I had done my stints there, but I, I thought, you know, within this bank, if I want to progress, then I need to go into those markets where, um, you know, it's the strength of the company. And unfortunately, you know, growing up in Japan, I speak Japanese, I speak a little bit of French, but um, we don't have a huge presence in Japan. We don't have a huge presence in French, um, Francophone Africa, and we don't have a huge presence in France as well. We've got a little office there, but um, so I couldn't use those skills. So when I was looking, it was literally like a blank slate for me um, with my skills. So I was looking at um, countries that we were located in that I, that, predominantly spoke English. So those, the ones that I was considering was London, um, Dubai, Hong Kong, Singapore, and South Africa. And the only reason I considered South Africa was because um, it was the hub for Af the Africa region at the time. And um, I had been there before. And I don't think I would have ever considered it if I hadn't had a short-term assignment here. Um, and then the secondary consideration for me from a personal career growth perspective was where can I have the largest opportunity and the biggest responsibilities. And um, of all the offers that I received and all the potential roles, um, the South African one hit both of those for me. You know, it was, a, it was a great market. I was familiar with it. I had just been there a couple of years ago, so I knew the people. And the opportunity that they gave me was a lot bigger in terms of responsibility than I would have gotten in these other markets that are much more saturated, that have a lot more talent. Um, and, um, and that's how I made the decision. But when I went, I thought, you know, I'll do it for say a year or two. It's just a stopover and then maybe I'll go back to Asia, be closer to my family. Um, I never ever thought it was gonna be a permanent home, but um, obviously <laughs> I have a permanent home here and um, I have a baby who is a South African citizen. So, <laughs> um, so you never know where life takes you. And I guess that's kind of the beauty in it as well. And you can attest to that as well, Nikki, because obviously I don't think you ever thought you were gonna permanently live in Korea and you know, these things happen. So yeah, it's yeah, exciting. Well, that not, not permanently, but I, di I didn't expect that I'll be uh, going to year seven, year seven in Korea. I, I don't think that was yeah. ever um, considered. But yeah, you're, you're very correct. It's, uh, it's just, it's very, um, it's crazy to think uh, we don't really know where we will end up. And I think that's part of what's really cool, though, being international citizens. Um, you recently had a baby six weeks ago. Absolute insane <laughs> timing for anyone to have a child <laughs> um, with this COVID madness so what 
is it like right now in South Africa as well as, you know, I think from a lot of the world, although it officially started in January, right, for most of us, it seemed like it was about March, April is when things really took off. Um, so what yeah. has it been like the last three, four months? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I'll talk about my personal experience and then what South Africa has done. But um, it, it was a bit scary because, you know, it was my first child. I've never had major surgery before. Um, I was going in for a C-section. And um, the week before I was giving birth, I read in the news that my hospital had an outbreak of 69 staff members, um, nurses and doctors that have contracted COVID. And, um, you know, there's a lot of research out there that says pregnant women and, and babies are generally safe um, and they don't, they haven't had a high death rate in terms of after contracting COVID. But at the same time, um, there's just a lot of uncertainty in terms of the hospital policy. So they had shut down the hospital to do a deep clean. They had um, every single staff member tested. Um, and that's when they found the 69 staff members were positive. Um, they were trying to split the hospital into the COVID and the non-COVID side, but they were in the midst of doing that. And after they um, had the scare, they had to do a week-long deep cleaning where they actually shut the hospital down to any new admissions. And um, they were telling me, you know, I don't know if your husband can join you. And, you know, for me, it's quite an emotional time. Um, so I really wanted him there. And um, yeah, so there was quite a lot of uncertainty. And even the day that we got admitted to hospital, I had to take two COVID tests. He had taken a COVID test. We were both tested negative, which luckily, because otherwise we would have been um, subjugated to the COVID side of the hospital. But we get there and, um, you know, it's maybe like 5.30 or 6 a.m. in the morning, um, the time that our OBGYN told us to be there. And it's pitch black because, you know, they weren't admitting new patients and we're like knocking on the door and the security guy's rubbing his eyes and 15 minutes later, he's manually opening the door. And I'm thinking, geez, guys, do you know that I'm like getting operated on today? <laughs> yeah, and you're, 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 <laughs> you're eight months and a half pregnant or nine months pregnant and this is all happening. And how, were you, how did you manage to stay calm in those situations? I mean, I think you just you just do what you can, you know. And so, I mean, I was having um, detailed conversations with my OBGYN, and she she was um, quite senior at, from a hospital management perspective. So she would tell me what the latest hospital policy was. But the scary thing was every day it was changing. So the one day they were saying, "Oh, you have to leave the hospital after like maybe one or two nights after major surgery," or um, you know, your, your husband can no longer join you in theater. Obviously, no visitors are allowed at all. Um, and those things were changing every single day. So it, it was really kind of like, okay, well, I mean, I guess you can't get too hung up on things. As long as if you have a healthy baby and you're healthy, then um, I think that's the only way you can look at it. And we were actually really lucky because the day that she gave birth was the last day of lockdown in South Africa. And they had reopened that hospital that morning, <laughs> literally like 30 minutes before I, I had my surgery. Um, so then they reopened the postnatal ward and um, because he tested negative for COVID, they let him join in theater. Um, but some couples weren't as lucky. You know, there was a couple the day before us, the husband wasn't able to join. So, um, you know, I think you just kind of roll with the flow at this point. There's nothing more you can do. You're going to have the baby one way or the other. You can't keep it in. You know? <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah, you're going to have some stories for your, your child when she grows up about this whole yeah. birth. It's, it's, it's great to hear that it worked out though, ultimately. And you're all right yeah. now, you're nice home and just staying yeah. so we can just... <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And so speaking of staying put, is right now, can you guys go outside? Um, I just spoke to Jack the other day, he was in Chile, and he, he couldn't leave the house. Are, are you able to get groceries? What is it like over there? So, so um, we have a relatively newish president. I mean, he's been around um, for a while now, but, um, and, and he has taken a very proactive approach to managing the disease. Um, and I think we had one of the most um, strictest lockdowns globally, at least initially. So in um, mid-March, he had announced that we were gonna go into full lockdown and that it was a state of emergency. And full lockdown meant you can't leave the house at all, um, only for essential needs, which basically meant groceries and um, hospital uh, medical requirements. Um, and you can't, you can't go outside to exercise, you can't go outside to walk your dog, you can't go outside to chat to a neighbor, none of that. Um, they completely banned the sale of alcohol and cigarettes. 
Um, and so that was for just over a month. And, you know, that was, that was quite strict and quite sudden. So suddenly people are finding that, um, you know, you just, you can't go about your life as you used to. And um, it was pretty intense, but I guess, you know, the, the silver lining with all of that is they really did flatten the curve at first. And that was really important in South Africa because obviously we have one of the highest HIV rates. We have a very high um, tuberculosis infection rate as well. So a lot of the population is immunocompromised. And a lot of the population is living in what we call these townships, which are basically like the favelas in Brazil. Like they're basically shanty towns um, made out of tin roofs and t tiny little shacks that people are living on top of each other. Um, very, very often they don't have clean running water, um, you know, access to sort of infrastructure is not there. Um, so if it had spread quickly, there was going to be a very high death rate. And, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's something that, um, you know, I think the, con the country and our president managed to contain very well at the beginning. Um, and so now we're slowly opening up. So after a month of that, we're allowed to exercise for the first three hours of the day. For, and that kind of went on for a month. And now they're slowly opening up again. So now they're opening up alcohol sales and things like that. And, you know, people get creative under these things. So um, because alcohol was banned, a lot of people were brewing pineapple beer in their homes and like pineapples were um, skyrocketing in prices because everybody was buying pineapples to, to make pineapple beer. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just, it's interesting under lockdown, you kind of realize, you know, all these material things that you, you used to enjoy, like going to a restaurant or whatever you don't need, you know, even getting a haircut. Like I had to give my husband a haircut and he was so petrified at first. And then you're just like, you know what? It's fine. Like, it's fine if we don't look great. <laughs> you just manage, you know? <laughs> That's fascinating. The, well, the, the pineapple beer and, and people brewing on their own. It kind of reminds me of the Middle East. Some countries are dry. So people start making their own wine out of grapes. Did, did you guys make any of your own alcohol or did you have any friends that made their own alcohol? We had this huge stash of alcohol. I was pregnant, so I wasn't drinking any of it. All right. So as we wrap up this conversation today, um, again, thanks for coming to this episode four, although you're the eighth guest. And um, I like to usually let the uh, guests sort of talk at the end what is to come, right, in these next months or years or decades. So what is coming up with Sarah Witten? And I um, just want to give you the ball and, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, you've caught me at a huge turning point in my life, like after the birth of my first child. And um, as you heard from the earlier responses to your questions, you know, I've been very much focused on um, progressing my career. And that has been like my number one priority for the last 10 years. And, um, you know, allowing women to have it all, to have to have a family, to have a child and to succeed at work. And now that I have a baby, it's it's. Um, you know, it's a, it's a time of reflection as well, because I've never stepped away from the working environment my whole life. I mean, even in high school, you know, for summer holidays, I was doing internships and whatnot. So it's really the first time, and it's not quiet because the baby is a lot of work in a different way, but it's a, it's a time for reflection to see, you know, where to kind of reassess where I am in my life, where I want to get to. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I've got some time to still work through it. Like I'm, um, I'm taking six months off and I'm a month and a half into that. Um, and hopefully as the baby gets a bit easier, I have a time, uh, have a more time for myself to kind of think through, um, different things. But, um, but you know, I, I want, I want to be able to, um, progress in an environment where I'm also, um, having a positive impact on the world. So you know, you don't really hear that from people that work in finance or the people are, who are bankers. Um, but the way that I've kind of fulfilled that need was through the Diversity and Inclusion Council. Um, and, you know, I would like to embed it more and more into the data, daily work that I do as well. So maybe, you know, um, participating more in like funding green energy projects or, um, you know, working for a developmental organization or something like that. Um, I'm sure there's ways that I can do that both through the, my current employer or, you know, assessing different options externally as well. Um, so I think ultimately I want to get to somewhere like that and also get to a job that maybe has um, a, a good work-life balance um, and, uh, and so that I can focus on my family as well. But um, yeah, well, I've got time to work through all of that in the next couple months and um, I'll keep you posted, Nikki. 
Yeah, it's definitely been really an uh, educational opportunity for me because I think the people in my industry in education, they, they tend to kind of be morally, you know, they, they tend to be like a moral police and they tend to sort of like, you know, think, as you said, uh, there's sort of this impression of, of finance being very much sort of money about money and not much about, you know, being an agent of social change, but seeing people Which like- Oftentimes is. <laughs> so you're not true. wrong in that. <laughs> there, there are some individuals that you're, you're right, that, that maybe are just, just about the money. But, but seeing someone like you being, you know, the agent of social change and working in a, in a very male dominated as well as very money oriented in, industry and changing, you know, making tangible social change through things like joining the 30% club. It, it's quite inspirational. So uh, again, th not, thank you for not just being on this show, but um, uh, it's very inspirational to hear people in your industry, which I'm guilty of being judgmental towards. And I think you've definitely been able to educate me a bit, uh, even just in this last hour about the 30% club and whatnot. So um, again, thank you for being on. And um, yeah, let's, let's, um, let's uh, have you back on um, maybe when the baby is one or two or however old, <laughs> maybe when you get back to work. Yeah. In a year or two, you know, who knows? I don't even know at this stage. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So, uh, yeah, have a, a good day and um, see you see you around somewhere on this globe. <laughs>